Good evening. My name is Julia Burns, and I am the Administrative Assistant at the Monroe County Historical Association. I'm pleased to welcome you to our monthly third Thursday lecture series. On your screen, you'll find your menu bar and the controls to submit questions via the Q&A function. We ask that you use this to post all of your questions for tonight's speaker. Questions can be submitted at any time throughout the program, but will be answered following the presentation. I'm so very happy to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Anthony M. Stevens Arroyo, as professor at Brooklyn College, has had a distinguished career in academia. Born in Philadelphia, he's known for advocating Hispanic culture among Latinos in the United States. In 1992, he was awarded the Citation of Honor by the National Columbus Day Committee. Since moving to Monroe County in 2000, he's become an active member of many organizations and currently serves on the Monroe County Historical Association's Board of Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Stevens Arroyo, who will give us his presentation, Columbus, the Man and the Myth. I'll stop my screen share. Tony, if you wanna share your screen, you can take it away. There we go. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I, uh, I'm Anthony Stevens Arroyo. Thank you uh, to Julia and the other people at the uh, Sark Association for the generous presentation. Uh, what I hope to do this evening in a very straightforward way is present to you some animated slides about Christopher Columbus. It's my conviction that looking at people in history and the context gets us closer to what the truth is about them. And it's so much easier to talk about the truth, the context, the historical times than it is about the symbols, the images, the resonances that we create ourselves, what I'll call myths. So let's take a look at Christopher Columbus and some of the myths that surround his life. I found five of them. And let's see as we look through his own history, his real history, how those are connected. So the first myth is that Columbus was not an Italian, believe it or not. That's what some people say. And they use this fact that he never wrote in Italian, that his Spanish and Portuguese that he did write in were not his native languages, that he had flaming red hair. How many Italians did they know who had red hair? They note that he had access to navigational instruments invented by Muslims. So it wasn't always European or Christian. And he used cryptic words with mystic Illuminati symbols and letters. Now, all these facts are true, but they're disconnected. However, people connect them and they say that it hid the fact that he was a Jew. Well, even people that accept he was Italian feel that he was special. So they adduce the fact that he was educated by saying that he was born in Mallorca to Prince Carlos de Viana or that he was the bastard son of Pope Innocent VIII raised by Domenico uh, Colombo, that he was the grandson of the rich Lancia Colombo from Casale Monferrato. The truth is his education came because he simply read a lot of books and taught himself. And yes, the Vikings, the Normans had brought red haired genes to Italy. So there are real red haired Italians. Here is a outline of his family life his father and mother's name there, Domenico Colombo and Susanna Font Fontana Rosa. He was the eldest of his family. He had two brothers with whom he collaborated during his life. His sister stayed in Genoa, married a cheesemaker. And there's reports of a child, Giovanni, who died uh, shortly after birth as an infant. And those facts come from the baptismal records and are very secure. Now, what's important is that Genoa produced sailors, not just seamen. And that's the beginning of how Columbus was able to embark on his voyages. In case you don't know where Genoa is, look at the map, I just put a little circle around Genoa. As a landlocked sea, the Mediterranean lacks major currents and trade winds. 
And so most travel on the Mediterranean, going back to the time of the Greeks and the Romans was by rowing. You may perhaps remember the scene from uh, the picture uh, with uh, Carlton Heston about Ben-Hur, how he was in the galleys and they had to row this way to, to, to uh, ram other ships in battle. Yes, they did use uh, sails, but because of the lack of reliance on a constant current or, or winds, most travel was by rowing. Except that, and this was a penalty to Gen 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 Genoa, by the way, if you see where it is relationship to v Venice, which has a red triangle around it, uh, Genoa had a, a, a longer voyage to make to get to the, Medi the uh, Levant, which is the, what we would call the Holy Land or the places that the Muslims controlled. And so to sail uh, again by rowing out of Genoa, you had to go past these islands of Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, and you had to be near the shores of Tripoli that were piracy as late as the time of the US Marines. And so uh, the advantage of Genoa, however, came because it's at the foot of the Alps. It is the only major port in the Mediterranean with a sufficient breeze to launch sailing ships. And so sailing ships became uh, a kind of uh, special aspect of Genoa's travel and trade. And if you can think about it, if you use a sail as your major propulsion and you don't rely on those slaves who are doing the galleys, then you have more room for your cargo. And that's what's very important. Moreover, this encouraged ships and sailing knowledge for Atlantic traffic, where in fact you could use sailing. So rather quickly, Genoa sailed into the Atlantic using Portugal as one of its bases. And here you'll see a map where Genoa, we showed you where it was, but going the other way, they talked, uh, they could stop at these very important ports in Marseille, Barcelona, Cadiz, and of course, Lisbon. So that explains why he had education and why he was able to sail from Genoa and become a Atlantic sailor. But it doesn't answer how come he never wrote a word in Italian? Well, the reason is, that the language that he spoke was called the Ligurian language. And it was an unwritten language. It was kind of like uh, at the, the time when Latin was fading from people's common expression, although almost all of the documents and the important papers in Genoa were uh, written in uh, Latin. To give you an idea of the differences between Italian and this Ligurian language, the word for cow in Italian is bove, and the way it's pronounced in Ligurian is bau, uh, for ship, imbarcazione, or imbarcazione, uh, for cheese, formaggio, and formaggio, and uh, for a young boy, Giovanni, or zuvenu. So you can see that although the language uh, could be understood very easily, it was not to gain the acceptance in the literary world. And as a result, people did not use that language that they spoke for their written messages. Of course, we take a look at his name. His Italian version was Columbo, and you may perhaps um, know Columbo in another context. I have a little graphic there as a joke. Uh, but he frequently wrote his name in Italian as Columbus. The Portuguese translation of Colombo would be Pombo. But I guess he just didn't like the sound of that, felt it was too distant from Columbus, which sounded better. So he took the Portuguese name Colom, meaning colonist. And when he went into Spain, in Spanish, his name became Colon. It's important to understand that only Italy could have produced Columbus. Understand that in the 15th century, there was no king of Italy. So that meant there was no feudalism imposed on the different territories that made up the peninsula or the Italian uh, uh, land of Italy, what became Italy. Now, without nobles, that is to say, counts and dukes who controlled everything, people lived in cities and could rise by their own merits and their own skills to rather important places in government, politics, and church. So the cities in Italy, at the time we're looking at, governed themselves as inspired by the Roman Republic. The town council was also the chamber of commerce. It's important to say these were not democracies where everybody voted. They were republics, were representatives, in this case, people that were wealthy and were involved with uh, 
business were able to determine the future of the city. But without their own king, it meant that the city contracts could be made with other monarchs. So Italians could make deals with the French king, the German king, uh, the emperor, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and what have you. Uh, Italians, and we'll have to add Jews, were free from the land-based feudalism, and because they lived in cities, they turned to trade. The cities were republics, they were meritocracies, and they became wealthy centers for trade companies. And the conclusion is that the Italian peninsula housed the most literate, the most artistic, the most scientifically advanced peoples in Europe at the time. So that the Italian Renaissance was the West's greatest Renaissance. So now we go to the second myth, knowing that, that Columbus really was Italian. Uh, and the myth is that he was a product of the Renaissance. And in that characterization, he fought the medieval church's control on modern ideas and invoked science to prove that the world was round. He improved the navigation tools for his sailors and his knowledge of the writings of Marco Polo demonstrates his advanced knowledge of the different world cultures. That's the myth. His myth says his only mistake was thinking he had reached China. But you know what? The world was round before Columbus. Observation of the Earth's shadow on the moon during an eclipse proved the world was round, going back to the ancient Greeks. So navigators at sea as well had been able to move from one place to another, and they saw that the world was a globe and it wasn't flat. So the issue was how to gauge the circumference of the Earth. They could see the shadow on the moon. Was it like a baseball? Or was it like a basketball? How big was the earth? And you notice the shadow of it, both a baseball and a basketball is going to be the same. Erastasthenes of Cyrene had estimated the size of the earth and pretty closely, uh, by the way, as early as the third century before Christ. So when Columbus came on the scene, especially because people had through Marco Polo understood how far away China was, People could estimate the distance from, let us say, Spain to China, but they also knew how big the earth was. So if you subtract the mileage or the distances that you are aware of from the distances that are the entire cast of the, of the earth, then you'll know the, the distance that's been uncharted between China and Spain. And calculating the size of that earth, experts considered sailing from Europe to China was beyond nautical possibility. No ship was big enough to hold enough water and food to sustain the crew for the time it would take to travel such a distance. But Columbus at an autodictat, as sometimes you know, people who don't have formal education seize upon something that they read and they hold on to it. And Columbus believed the underestimate of a Paolo Toscanelli about the size of the earth. And he used the book of Marco Polo on China and Japan as his guide. Now, what we do know about Columbus, and I'll try to, this is the only biography I'm going to give really. Uh, most city dwellers in the Italian city states could read and write in order to conduct business. So it's really not at all strange that Cristoforo was literate. His father was a weaver and tailor who eventually bought a tavern in Genoa, although he seems not to be, have been very successful in any enterprise. The real wealth uh, for Genoa was in maritime trade. And so as a teenager, Columbus was apprenticed to the merchant ship as what we might call a cabin boy. When he was about 20, he was shipwrecked in 1471 off the Portuguese coast. He was rescued, he got out of the water and uh, a, a fellow Italian uh, rescued him and got him a job with the Genovese Trading Company in Lisbon run by the Centurione family. Columbus, when he was on these ships, when he's this work, constantly read books to improve himself. And because paper was hard to come by, he often filled the printed pages with handwritten notes while on his voyages. In fact, there's a museum that has many of these books with his uh, writings and his commentaries. So we have a very accurate record of who he is, where he was, and what he thought about when he was there. His, with his brother Bartolomeo hired as a map maker in Lisbon, Columbus worked up the company ladder and he became a trader traveling north in 1477 and south in 1478, buying and selling commodities for his company. And when he was in the south, he married a woman named Felipa Pastrello y Moniz, 
uh, excuse me, this is a little map of where it is. And the woman that he married, that's probably not a real accurate picture of her, uh, but uh, by marrying her at age, she was elderly in terms of people getting married at 16 when she was 23. That was, you know, like the last chance, so to speak. Uh, but by not demanding a dowry, he gained something that was more important to him. And that was a title from his father-in-law which was a grant of the impoverished Isla de Porto Santo, which is only 42 miles uh, 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 large. And it's off the Madeira. So you see on the map where Madeira is, and this little tiny little dot on the north is where this uh, San Porto Santo is. Felipe bore San Diego in 1480. They married 1479. She died in either 1484, 1485. Columbus does not refer very much to her. So it does not seem that there was great love uh, in this marriage. What there was was a title. He took, uh, uh, after her death, he took a, um, a Beatriz Enriquez de Arana's mistress who bore him a son, Fernando, in 1488. And he never married Beatriz because, and here's my speculation, she was of a lower class. Now, how did Columbus get the idea of sailing west? already said he started working as a sailor in Lisbon at the age of 20. And some of the trips that he took were on those little lines, which would go through Ireland, uh, the western coast of England, and then as far north as Iceland. And what they would trade was olive oil and wine. The wine is called port wine, goes from Portugal. And they would get tin and salted codfish, which is known in countries in the Mediterranean as bacalao. Now, when he was in Ireland, he heard stories of St. Brendan finding new land in the West and from the people in Iceland of Leif Erikson and Vineland. And one day on that Northern trip, and he has this written in his book with a picture, by the way, he saw the frozen body of someone who to him looked Chinese sailing in a kayak, just kind of like floating in. And so this, con this confirmed to him that there was land to the West and that the land to the West was China. He aspired to find a Western sailing route and to establish a trading house for his family, his own uh, operation, his, uh, he would be in charge. Now, in order for that to happen, in order to meet, you know, the King of China, the, the Khan, Great Khan, he knew that he needed authorization from royalty to deliver a treaty to the emperor of China. This was what he learned from Marco Polo. Marco Polo kept trying to get to see the, the emperor of China and really could not make any kind of deal because he did not represent an equal power. And so Columbus recognized that he had to have this royal power behind him, uh, but in order to have himself as the person who was in charge, he needed a noble title to command an expedition as admiral because only nobles could act as life or death judges, which was one of the powers of an admiral at sea. So that explains the importance of him marrying um, uh, uh, his first wife uh, in order that he would get this title. And uh, what's important to understand, he was always about getting rich. Now let's take a little course here in money making in the Middle Ages. And we call it pre-capitalist because basically it was a barter economy where the law of supply and demand was very evident. And let us take imaginary uh, trip into this medieval fair where there's one in an area that grows flax, which can be spun into linen and another one where there's raising of sheep, which can be made for wool. And it's the ingenuity of the merchant to make profit at the market. So you see there the picture of, uh, of a medieval fair. This would be like um, the West End Fair on steroids. That's basically what it was. And it's interesting that in the Middle Ages, each of the different places in Europe used to choose a different saint's day in order to have this, uh, these fairs. And, and these fairs, this way, by, by staggering them at different times of the year, the merchants who had very great um, uh, store of commodities would then travel individually to the different, the different fairs. So uh, it's Stroudfest uh, on, on steroids is what I would say. Now here's our trader. And uh, 
uh, before he left for this county fair, he came from a place where there was lots of flax for linen. And so he had a linen shirt and he travels to this fair. And when he gets to this fair, he meets a fellow that says, oh, that linen shirt looks great. You know, here, all we have is, is wool and it's scratchy and it's hard. I'll tell you what, I'll give you two of my woolen shirts if you give me that one linen shirt. So that's what our merchant has. He exchanges one for two and he goes back to the place where they have linen. And guess what? He meets another fellow, a couple of them, as a matter of fact, that say, oh, those woolen shirts are so much better in the winter than what we have here with only flax. I'll give you two for, for one of those. So now our trader has four linen shirts. And what he does is he goes back to where they had the a wool area and he meets the same sort of guy again. And now at two for one, he has eight woolen shirts, all because he knew how to trade. The key here is that the longer the distance for the commodity traded, the greater the added value. Now, this is very simplistic, but by 1470, when Columbus is, is uh, joining this Ciccioni company, uh, we see that the system of barter and exchange had evolved quite a bit. Warehouses were located in cities along the trading route to store goods. So the local goods would go to the trading house, the ship would come and it would begin changing and preparing itself for its journey. And so uh, the people who were in the trading company bought and sold items for an exchange in a shopping style like an emporium. So this particular uh, house, which is an actual trading house would have been like the Walmart of its days. Now, it's also true that rival business families often carried on feuds in order to monopolize the trade in a particular place. And you have Shakespeare's uh, explanation of the feud between the Montu Montagu and the Capulets in D Romeo and Juliet. Eventually, the warehouses held gold and silver for future transactions. Obviously, you can't put all those shirts on ship all the time, and people would negotiate with gold and silver to advance costs for the ships to carry and trade the commodities over set routes. And they would divide the profits according to the size of the share of the investment. So this, you can understand, is the beginning of lending banks and the capitalist system, which the trading houses of Italy were able to create. The goods, the delivery schedule, and the money linked to the warehouse operations, however, required security. And because the warehouses were not under a king, the protection had to be from mercenaries, not national soldiers. So families hired managers, that they called consiglieri, to work in the trade, and then they, they hired soldiers to provide the security. Because they were spread out over long distances, the Centurios from, from Genoa, they had houses in the Black Sea. They had houses in, in Lisbon and in, in, in Bristol in England. And so in order to trust the people who were going to be in charge, they had the custom of only appointing family members in charge. Although they would reward talent by a person outside the family by allowing, allowing them to marry into the family. Although they were outside feudalism, these companies adopted titles of feudalism. So the head would be called the Dominus or the Dom, and the military had the Capo, who would be in charge of that. The wealth gained from trade undermined feudalism. These trading houses were sources of revenue for the kings because they were taxed in exchange for the permission to operate in the kingdom. And there was a license to enter ports and depart with cargo, which were regulated. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see a ship that's actually from Venice. They did have sails, but they relied on those oars for their uh, travel. The trading families, for their part, relied on monopolies to maximize profits in rural cities. And often they used the bread and the circuses strategy to make sure that people like the consiglieri in the town. And here you see uh, a medieval festival with people enjoying themselves with free booze and free food. Merchants were allies to mo monarchs because the merchants lacked feudal title to land and therefore they were no threat to authority. The dukes and the counts inherited dynastic titles and it could challenge uh, the royal heirs. And these were the cause of so many civil wars, like for instance, the War of Roses between uh, in, in England, the House of Lancaster and the House of York.
Trading families often loan money for water, wars and buildings, collecting favors in lieu of repayment. And it was not unusual for them to loan to both sides to whoever would win, they would win. Wealthy families like the Orsini and the Medici produced Renaissance cardinals and several popes of dubious piety, but of great influence and control over one third of the Italian peninsula. In a word, the popes became the kings of Italy. That was what they served as. And here you see a picture on the one hand of the Medici Pope, Leo X, and his niece, Catherine of Medici uh, right alongside. I don't know if there's a family resemblance, but I see one. She married Henry IV of, 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 uh, in 1600 and became queen of France, even though she had no royal blood. And her son would be Louis XIII uh, to be followed by the famous son, King Louis XIV. Okay, now the competition to the Italian trading houses came mostly from Jews in the Mediterranean. And that's because the Jews, like the Italians, did, could not aspire to a feudal title to lands in the Christian nation because the feudal system required an oath of fealty with Christ's name. You couldn't even ride a horse or a, a bear a sword. And so the, the typical picture of a Jew would be to have a cart rather than sitting on top of the horse and in the middle picture, you see the idea of how um, with that oath of, of officer, one was knighted and became a part of the, of the feudal system. Uh, also, Jews uh, were allowed to charge interest by their religion, whereas Christians were prohibited because interest was usury. In, uh, in Spanish cities, the Jews preserved family trading wealth by intermarriage with Christians, and they became conversos. And here we have a picture of a converso. He's very famous. His name is Luis de Sant'Angel, and we'll see him in another slide. And here we go to the third myth. This is Queen Isabella, because that's where Columbus finally got the permission to sail. And the myth is that Queen Isabella sold her pearls to finance Columbus expedition. And the myth says she was the only monarch in Europe to believe in his vision, that she was impressed by his religious piety and dedication to Catholicism. And she saw Columbus as the ideal person to bring Christianity for the natives. And because of that, she secretly took her own personal resources, her, her pearls, and she stole them from the king to give them to Columbus. And the myth continues that Isabella was secretly in love with Columbus. Telenovela. Ooh. Well, those are all myths. The reality is Isabella was a queen in her own right because Castile allowed women in the crown. And on the map, you'll see Castile, 1469, Aragon, 1469. That's the year they married. Aragon would only allow a male. Castile would allow a, a, a woman. And she kept being the queen, even though she married the King of Aragon. Uh, their big battle was to gain the control of Granada there in the bottom of the, of the map. And that came about in April of 1492. And two months later, Columbus got the permission to sail the ocean blue in 1492, remember? Uh, just as a bit of a footnote, eventually when it came to replacing uh, Fernando and Isabel, the grandees, the nobles of the time, chose the grandson, Carlos, because as a male, he could rule both at the same time. And that's how Spain was united. Columbus, for his part, had a contract that he demanded before he would set sail. And it became known as the La Capitulaciones de Santa Fe. And so it had the standard thing about so much money for this and so much of a share for that and so forth and so on. It guaranteed, however, two very special things, monopoly franchise or access to the route. Columbus wasn't going to share knowledge of how to sail across the sea to this place without a permission from somebody else, without a payoff. And nobility rights to rule any islands he would discover. He would literally ask for the title of viceroy or substitute king. Now, the price of what he was asking had been too high for Portugal and even for Fernando, the king of Aragon. But Queen Isabella made the deal, thinking along with Columbus, that he would have rights only to service stops on the way to China. So I chose this one uh, from the New Jersey Turnpike, and it says Earl of Sandwich. And the idea was that if they had to take his route, they would have to stop 
where he had control and he would charge people for water and food uh, on their journey. So that's how he was trying to make uh, his career. But when it became apparent after 1493 that that contract would give the Columbus family title to more land than there was in Spain, King Fernando became very upset. He took the case to court to break the contract, although he had to wait till Isabella and Columbus had both died. And the judges at the University of Salamanca decided against the king and in favor of the Columbus family heir, Diego Colon in 1511. So for a while, these colonies were literally gated communities uh, controlled by the Colon family. Um, but Columbus San Diego, the one with the title, married into the powerful family of the Duke of Alba and then settled out of court in 1536 for a pension for his descendants that would be giving forever as long as Spain had colonies, which ended in 1898. And it ended with Diego, and there's a picture of Diego, and that's a real picture of him. Now, Columbus was a conniving salesman. Queen Isabella had been raised in a convent, became Isabella la Catholic in history, because she was one of the few monarchs of the time who took religion seriously for private life. You see a picture of the convent at Arevalo, where she was raised. And the reality is she was too busy to have any affair. She was married at 18 years old. She had seven pregnancies in 15 years. You figure that out, ladies? Had two stillborn children. And while she was pregnant, she fought a civil war for her title because her uh, half-sister claimed the title with help from Portugal. And then they went against both Fernando and Isabella, a war against the Muslims in Granada. And, uh, so she died at the age of 52 in 1506. What is to her credit, again, because of her uh, real faith, she sought to evangelize the natives in the Canary Islands, which had been discovered before that 1470s. And she made Columbus promise to do the same for the discoveries of the natives in these other islands that he found. Columbus, for his part, promoted his name as destiny. He knew that she was very religious. So he said, my name is the bearer of Christ. Christopher. And then he put, when he finally got his ships, he put the Crusaders cross on the ships. Now, this is very interesting because most of the sailors at the time, they named their ships after prostitutes. Okay. So the one ship was called Nina, which is the babe. And the other was called Pinta, the painted lady. And the third was called Maria Galeante, which is, means Mary, the party girl. But because he knew that the queen was very pious, he changed the name to Santa Maria, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. He flattered her love for pearls, pomp, and parades. When he found pearls in the New World, he said, these are only for you. And his letters carry a cryptic phrase used by a secret movement called the Illuminati about their special role in history. And uh, Here's a picture of what he would put at every letter. And people have spent forever trying to figure out what it all means. Some have said it says Shaddai, Adonai, whatever. Uh, others say it's uh, Somos Servos Altissimo Santissimo. Whatever it was, you understand at the time, Joaquin de, de Fiore and Nostradamus uh, were making their prophecies. So it's in the context of the times that people thought they were something special about those days. And remember, uh, Europe had just emerged from the Black Death. They lost one third of their population. Isabella borrowed money from Luis de Sant Angel, the third generation Jewish convert. And to show that he was really above this contract, uh, Columbus said he willed his income for a new crusade to liberate Jerusalem. So he played the role of a salesman. But in fact, he tried to raise money to finance his gated community by selling native slides and acting like a lord. That is to say, he said, uh, when somebody tried to steal something, I want to chop your finger off, I'm going to um, slit your nose because that never heals and it becomes a mark of having been a criminal, which denied the right of other lords to do such a thing. So it made him very unpopular. Uh, what Isabella did. She made Columbus return natives sold in Seville in 1495 as slaves, said, no, they go back to, to their new world and you have to pay for it and they're going to be free. And finally, because he did such a poor job of governing where he was, she relieved him of command in 1500, put him in chains and on trial for bad government. There had been a revolt. And after all these years of all this investment, she had to pay the money back 
and she wasn't getting any money from the investment. And so uh, Columbus was made to promise not to antagonize the colonists anymore in order to escape permanent jail. And he was actually banned from Santo Domingo while the monarchs appointed a custodian. And uh, he suffered a nervous breakdown. His red hair turned completely white virtually overnight and he died in 1508. So I think that ends the idea that, that uh, Queen Isabella was in love with him. The fourth myth, and we have only one more to go after this, Columbus was a model of the new American spirit, it is said, that his discovery dispelled the eclipse of a stale and anachronistic Europe, that he put science over religious obscurantism, and that when he was punished, such as in, we had mentioned before, put in chains, it was because he was in favor of a new world free of monarchs. And this is so consonant with the idea of the United States of America, and in fact, of the republics in Latin America. Uh, but you'll see that the capital of the United States was named after Columbus. It was named after Washington as the first president and the uh, head of the army that created the revolution, but it was also called the District of Columbia after him. Now, school books used to carry the image of Columbia as the image for this United States. And here you see a drawing from the time right after the Civil War of Columbia with Washington and Lincoln in the back. And she's wearing what's called the Phrygian cap. It's a cap of emancipated Greco-Roman slaves. And if you recall, if you've ever seen Les Miserables, the little fellow has a a Phrygian cap, that's like it being free. However, Columbia, goodbye, Columbia. She was replaced with a French lady. That's a picture of the French lady. There are US, 23 US cities named after Columbus, the most famous in Ohio, which was founded in 1812. But there's over 6,000 schools, municipal buildings, roads, rivers, and mountains with his name. Perhaps the most common, the closest to us would be Columbus Circle in New York City. Now, how did this become the storybook Columbus? Well, Sleepy Hollow writer Washington Irving, yes, that's the guy back in the 1820s, he had written all these tales about Knickerbocker tales up there in uh, his part of uh, New York State. He worked at the US Embassy in Madrid and he just surprised that people had very little appreciation for Columbus. He was not even considered this, the discoverer. So with the extra time he had, apparently there was not much work in the embassy. He began working with original sources, and he, in 1828, he published a popular history of Columbus. Now, it was very accurate and had the real facts in it, but he embellished it. He made it into what we would call a docudrama with very famous speeches and uh, moments that he borrowed from Galileo's trial and so forth. After the Civil War, when public schools became the order of the day in much of the United States, Irving's Life of Columbus, at least in parts of it, became the public school reading of Columbus. And this coincided in uh, 1871 with the efforts at Italian unification. And that meant that Italians in the United States who had migrated uh, stopped calling themselves Napolitani or somebody from Lombardy or whatever, uh, Siciliani, and they started talking about themselves as Italians. And so there began parades in honor of Columbus to foster unification of Italy and to foster the pride and the identity with the Italian communities. Then in 1882, uh, Father McGivney, a uh, priest in New Haven, uh, Irish, uh, founded a benevolent society for Catholics, essentially uh, widows and uh, real estate fund uh, people could borrow from a, like a, a community thrift uh, bank. But he named it after Columbus, and part of it was to adopt this regalia that Columbus with the Middle Ages and the Renaissance and so forth, and uh, the knights no longer used the plumes, as they would say it, but that was the inspiration at the time. Finally, in 1969, President Lyndon Bage Johnson made Columbus Day a national holiday for everywhere in the U.S. with a day off from work. The point is the quintessential American of Washington Irving's Columbus back there in his book in 1828 was embraced by these Italian and Catholic immigrants 
to prove that they were there with Columbus from the very beginning and they were genuine Americans. And so when we look at Columbus, we have to understand that there's more invested in him as myth than there was in reality, but that those myths are real in the sense that they affect people's imagination, commitments, and their sentiments. Now, the last myth we'll talk about is Columbus was a racist responsible for genocide of millions of Native Americans. The fact is he didn't discover America, it was already there. and even came later after the Vikings had possibly others from Africa. The, it is true, tens of millions of Native Americans died from diseases that Columbus brought on the ship with his soul, his uh, different sailors. And that his presence started a cycle of rape and oppression by European invaders on two continents, North and South America. And that Columbus presence began the eradication of native religions and cultures. So people say, we should honor the indigenous people with a holiday, viva la raza. And if you take a look at the little post that I put there, I'll read what it says. Wanted for raping several nine and 10 year old girls. Wanted for the murder of 8 million Arawaks while enslaving them, for cannibalism, for feeding babies to dogs, stealing hundreds of thousands of square kilometers of land, using biological weapons to kill 97 million people, sending 9,000 Native Americans to Europe as slaves, and get one US dollar for turning them in. But this is a myth. Remember I said it's a myth. The reality is Columbus was a sinful man. He had his human faults like so many others. And it's interesting that he would praise the natives or denigrate them, however it meant to serve his purposes of having his wealth, his name, and his own trading company. So this little uh, citation is from the same letter that he wrote. Tell me whether he's praising them or denigrating them. The Indians are so naive and so free with their possessions that no one who has not witnessed them would believe it. When you ask for something they have, they never say no. To the contrary, they offer to share with anyone. Then he says, they would make fine servants. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. So he was willing to play both sides of the coin in order to get his advantage. The fact is that slavery had always been the punishment for war or rebellion. And so when the natives rebelled against the uh, Spaniards, Columbus did what people have been doing for centuries, for millennia, which is you make the uh, people who are soldiers against you into slaves so they don't just pick up and have the, the battle again. So slavery as a punishment was not invented by Columbus. And in fact, Columbus worried about the extinction, extinction of the natives for all the wrong reasons. He wanted them to work for him. And it was uh, Isabella who intervened and she forbade making new slaves of the natives. In other words, she didn't abolish slavery, but she said, you cannot go to these countries where these people have done no wrong, have not rebelled anything, and then make them slaves. So it was her that stopped that idea. Reality is that uh, slaves weren't as important to Columbus, except he could sell them in Seville for money. But what he wanted his serfs to be, he wanted his the natives to be serfs, like uh, in the feudal model. And the word that they use in Spanish was encomienda. But the idea of working and tilling the land was something that did not was not accepted or understood by the natives in the Caribbean who were what we would call hunters and gatherers. They really didn't do agriculture in quite the same way and they were not uh, staying in fixed places. So the encomienda it was virtual slavery for them, especially when they were turned into mining and it was denounced as early as 1511. It's important to note that the lack of immunity immunity to European and African diseases would have killed the Native Americans, even if they, not Columbus, had been the first to cross the oceans to discover Europe. And here you see a picture of the coronavirus, which has, you know, been so bad for us in our own, this, just this, uh, what is the 18 months or 12 months. And here uh, in the other side, you see a picture of the noxious effects of smallpox. Ironically, the mixing of races gave offspring in what we call Latin America, inherited immunity. Because when you had an Indian marrying a European or an African, the children acquired the immunities that had been present 
in that other race. So by being immune to, you, to American diseases, as well as European and African and Asian ones, interracial persons were the healthiest in the Americas. And in fact, the violence against the natives got worse after Columbus. Pope Paul III excommunicated anyone denying that natives were human beings. And the fact that he had to excommunicate, it means that that's what people were saying. And in fact, Friar Las Casas argued against Aristotle's theory of natural slavery. Aristotle had said certain people in certain races are, are incapable of self-government. They're savages. They, they're naturally, they belong as slaves. Uh, interestingly, the native cultures and religions often partially survived Catholic evangelization because of religious syncretism. So in this little picture here from New Mexico, that is a solar sign. And you see it you know, in license plates and what have you. But the Christian missionaries uh, were wont to say that it was the cross of Christ that the natives already worshiped. And therefore this was uh, a prefigurement of the Christian faith. The reality is the challenge to Columbus authority was from Spaniards who went native and lived like the first peoples, abandoning obedience to the monarchs and rejecting Christian moral strictures in a version of the Tahiti syndrome. And so, Latin America is constituted in a very special way by the mixing together of a certain sense of unity that came by language and custom that was fused together with European institutions. Let's evaluate Columbus because this is the last slide I wanna use. Columbus actions were largely defined by his historical context, his aspirations, insights, and innovations uh, were not so terribly unique. Much of the time, he was simply lucky. He did bring great persistence to his tasks, but he also had many pretensions focused on personal fame and wealth. He combined a forward-looking reliance on emergent capitalism with a nostalgic attachment to feudalism, and one canceled out the other as he tried to get rich and famous. He founded colonies, but was unable to profit from his achievement because of his ineffective rule. His real discovery was not of America, the Vikings were first, but what he discovered were the sea routes for sailing vessels to travel to and fro. So on the African equatorial current towards the New World and on the Gulf Stream back towards Europe. Those that returned by sail was not possible by the Arctic route that was frozen half of the year. He also began the transfer of crops. The potato, corn, tomato, and pepper were sent to Europe and livestock, chicken, pig, and horse came to America. It's interesting that Spain considers Vicente Yanez Pinzon the discoverer of the Americas, not Columbus. Magellan was a better navigator for sailing west to China. Amerigo Vespucci's name, Americus, is on the map of two continents, not Columbus name. And Columbus died without fame. We're not even sure where he was buried. But the conclusion is the myths about Columbus say more about what people at any given time want him to be, not who he really was. And so I conclude my talk by saying, it's on you folks. Thank you. Okay, sorry for that delay there, Tony. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that in-depth presentation. We all learned a lot about Christopher Columbus today and we do have a few questions for you. Go ahead. Q and A. Okay. <clears throat> what were the primary commodities that Columbus traded? He went looking for spices. And the reason was, as you can, as you know, spices are very expensive, but they're very small. And so rather than, you know, commodities such as uh, iron or even foodstuffs, uh, that was what the, he desired to find. That's what Magellan found was the Spice Islands. So the idea was to go to China and then get a contract to be able to trade in spices. Okay. Uh, he never made it. It never, it never happened. Okay. 
Uh, another question. Did Ferdinand not have any input into the original contract between Isabella and Columbus? No, he signed it too. Okay. Um, how would you summarize what Columbus truly aspired to in all of his endeavors? Hey, Columbus wanted to get rich, rich and famous. He wanted to found his own trading house have a monopoly on the route to wherever he found, which hopefully was China and the Spice Islands, and to have a title to whatever he discovered so that his family would be nobles. And uh, this was a, you know, very much a part of the times. I showed you how the, the Medicis, who were essentially the same thing, they just had a very wealthy trading house and they used their wealth and influence to, to, to have uh, some members of their family uh, become popes, and then from there they negotiated the marriage to the King of France. And they married the King of France because, you know, that was um, an upward move and the King of France needed the money. Uh, also point out uh, that this was also true in Ferdinand's life. King Ferdinand uh, was the grandson of a Jewish woman, a conversa, who fame, you know, had wealth and uh, his grandfather seeking money for a marriage, or excuse me, for a war uh, to ensure his own power uh, decided the easiest way was to have a rich father-in-law. So um, these, um, it was not unreasonable for Columbus to aspire uh, to these sorts of things. And in fact, his son did marry into the house of the Duke of Alba, which is, would have been like the secretary of state or the, you know, Department of War or the uh, Attorney General or something. Um, but uh, so it was not unbelievable what he was aspiring to. It was all done by others. But of course, he, he was not the personality to be able to achieve all that he hoped for. Mm -hmm. In a certain sense, he was a magnificent failure. Uh, a question came in early on, um, what happened to Queen Isabella and Ferdinand? And then you kind of went into a few slides about them after that question was posed. Is there anything else you would add? Well, it's just that, uh, and, and I could do a talk on Isabella. It was one of the few marriages in uh, that time in Europe where the husband and wife really loved each other. They had a genuine affection. You know, a lot of these marriages were arranged and they didn't have. Uh, much confidence and it was, you know, very uh, uh, official marriage. Uh, but um, because both Ferdinand and Isabella had to wage war in order to get their marriage recognized as the legitimate heirs to the kingdom, and then to unify Spain by driving out the Muslims, um, uh, she was very popular, more popular than her husband. But um, she was, uh, you know, like the beginning of where kings were and queens look for popularity. Uh, about 50 years after they uh, passed on, Machiavelli in Europe, excuse me, in Italy, uh, wrote a monologue called The Prince. And in it, he gave instructions. And some people say it was a, a Spaniard. He was talking to Cesare Borja or Borja in Spanish. And he was saying how um, the good ruler would make himself popular and visible to the people by giving them parties, by uh, showing up at these uh, ceremonies and these marches, uh, so forth and so on. So uh, people look at Machiavelli as a, you know, devious, but in a sense, at the root of his book was the, the notion that if you represent yourself as worthy of, of leadership, uh, the people will respond to you and you should use these tools to your benefit. So Isabella, uh, without being Machiavellian, uh, inherited that kind of role in Spain that was tired of war and they wanted to be unified. They wanted to have the husband and wife be the king of Aragon and the queen of Castile because that meant there was a Spanish identity. So um, their, their, king, their monarchy was extremely important and is considered in much of Spanish literature is the high point uh, of the glorious beginning of, of Spain. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question coming in. 
Is there any truth to Amerigo Vespucci discovering America? No, what Vespucci did was, was draw maps. Uh, the Italians, as you said, were one, the most literate in the world, understood geography, ge geometry, and so forth, and had this meritocracy. So um, what we see is that uh, Americus Vespucci uh, latched on to the idea of drawing maps. He was sent to America to draw the maps and uh, was a way of making sure that Columbus wouldn't have his monopoly over where things were. So as he drew the maps of these different places, he wrote his name in the corner, Americus, because that was the uh, Latin for Amerigo Vespucci. And um, people that, uh, I guess they didn't understand Latin or they, or they didn't understand Italian, they thought that was the name of the place, that it was Americus. So gradually they, and then because terra is feminine as a Latin word, or tierra, uh, mm -hmm. Then it became America. America's land became uh, America. Oh, okay. Terra America. Okay, or thank Americana. you for explaining that. Yeah. Uh, another question: um, Didn't Columbus claim when land was first sighted that he had already seen it the night before? Yeah, he was. It was a real put on. <laughs> he the thing was, he had promised a gold piece to anybody that would see the land. And when finally he had to give the gold piece, he was like a miser, you know? Well, actually I saw it first, so I'm not gonna give you the gold. And the poor guy who actually did see, complained. He went back to, he's like, there's the papers. He went to court, he said, I discovered, I was the first one to see, he didn't give me the money. Uh, Pinzon, uh, uh, who was one of the sailors, I believe of the, the Nina, uh, he was the one that, told Columbus, you're, you're making a mistake. We need more wind. You have to go south. You have to do this. He bailed them out when they were willing to mutiny. So, and, and Pinzon continued to sail in the Caribbean, was the first person to, to discover the coast of Brazil. So, um, but that's a great question because it shows exactly why Columbus was such a, uh, uh, he, he was put on, he, you know, I'm gonna give the first mail, but guess what? I saw it first, so I'm not gonna give it to you after all, keep it to myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, how big of a role did the Inquisition play in Columbus's voyages? Nothing. Nothing, okay. No, they, they, the Inquisition, uh, when, when the war was over in 1492, um, Queen Isabella was told uh, the opposition uh, of the Muslims here, they had cooperation from Jews because uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the experience in Spain, um, the Jews felt that the Muslims treated them better than the Christians did. So um, when the battle was over Granada between uh, the Catholics, kings, and, and the Muslims, uh, lots of Jewish people lined up on the Muslim side. And um, although Muslims were a part of the situation, uh, they were given restrictive rules. And uh, same thing happened with Jews, that Jews were considered to be a part of a uh, fifth column, so to speak. And so they were told, uh, you can go to a Muslim land, the kind of like uh, you know, like the full of Afghanistan, you know, you don't want to be here, so you go somewhere else. Um, and, um, but if they professed allegiance to the Catholic faith and to the queen, which required them to switch religions, then they would be allowed to stay. So that was a, a very nasty moment. And uh, the Spanish Inquisition lasted longer than the Inquisitions that had been celebrated in other countries. Um, other countries, England, the, um, the kingdoms of uh, the, the Holy Roman Empire in France have been much more ruthless in expelling Jews. And a curious thing is that the Inquisition gets uh, maligned and probably deserves it as being, you know, this persecution. But the actual purpose of the Inquisition by Queen Isabella was to protect a legal process so that people would not unfairly be accused of being Muslims or being Jews, I'm sorry, of being Jews and expelled. Uh, 
I've seen cases today, for instance, where people get angry at a Latino family that's next door to them. So they call up and they say to the ICE, um, the, uh, the authorities to deport people and say, I think those people are, uh, are here as undocumented aliens. So the, the police come and they try to find out, is that true, is that not true? It's a hassle. Sometimes the people are there quite legitimately. Uh, but uh, that was the sort of thing that was going on uh, against Jews throughout history. And the Inquisition gets uh, maligned, I think, sometimes as being like the first or the worst. But uh, under Isabella in particular, it was to protect people. And I pointed again, out again that Santa Anjo was the third generation Jew. Uh, he was Jewish in ethnicity even if his religion was Christianity. And the same thing for the grandmom of, uh, of Fernando. So um, this is another you know, murky subject, but the question was, how did it play in with Columbus? Not at all. Okay. Uh, is it true that Columbus called the natives Indians because he thought he was an India? Yes. Boy, that whoever asked that question already knows the answer. <laughs> and, and you know, I, I just just a little word here. If you go through like you know the supermarket and you see person with the dark hair, very very black hair, very straight, very beautiful, sometimes you think it's a Latina person and it's somebody from India. So there is a kind of generic racial uh, disposition that makes that suggestion not so crazy. You know, it, it was it was based on his own his own desires. For it to be true, but uh, there's a certain logic to it as well. Okay. Lots of compliments coming in. The word spectacular has been used. Uh, great lecture with truths. Thank you for all this information and for your humor. <laughs> I think that's all our questions for tonight. Thank you so much for a fabulous presentation. Great. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, Remember how wonderful is the, the Monroe County Historical Association. <laughs> and uh, we now have uh, a, a, a group of documents and a collection of um, artifacts and posters and what have you from the beginnings of the Latino community here in the Poconos uh, in the 70s. And some recorded videos like this will be that have interviews with some of the founders of our community who are still among us as living treasures. So history keeps on going on and uh, maybe none of us will be ever as famous as Columbus, but we're <laughs> from the Poconos. So that makes us important too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor Stevens Arroyo. Thank you to everyone for tuning in and have a great night. Adios.